So, what I did last time was I was considering a group G and we were considering a subgroup H contained in G. Then we defined left and right courses. These are of the form H G and these are of the form G H, okay. where this element H is in H. So, this is runs over all the elements of this group H. Okay. And what we found was that this is partitioning the group into disjoint sets. That is important property of this object. Then we said we gave the definition H is an invariant for normal subgroup of G if let us say G H G inverse is H or G in G or G H is equal to H G. Okay. So, left and right cause is same. So, this means in right cosets are the same. Okay. So, now uh, I will give a plenty of examples okay, of this object, okay. but uh, before I even go on, okay, a classic example for us is okay, translations in Poincare groups form an invariant subgroup. Let us prove this. So, uh, say let me call these translations T4. So, T4 here is a group of translations of the form A1. Okay. So, A is at just elements of the four dimensional real vector space. And we want to form show that this is an invariant subgroup. So, you remember the rule of multiplication, you remember it A lambda A prime lambda prime, yeah. Do you know do you recall what it is? This had a particular formula, it is worth your while to go through the nodes, otherwise very soon you will lose me completely. Okay. So, this is of the form A plus uh, lambda A prime lambda lambda prime. Okay. This is the rule we rule of multiplication we got. We also found A lambda inverse was minus lambda inverse A lambda inverse for you can easily see what it is a lambda this object minus lambda inverse a lambda inverse is a plus lambda acting on this which is 0 and then you get 1. Yeah. 
ok. So, this is the inversion, now we want to check what happens if I take well so B lambda let us say let us say I want to check that the translations form an invariant subgroup. So, let me write here uh, lambda prime A lambda the inverse of this B lambda prime inverse this is I want to look at this I want to show that this is another translation. So, we just work it out this is equal to B plus lambda prime A lambda prime from here then the inverse of this which is minus lambda prime inverse B lambda prime inverse. So, you see that this part goes to 1 which is what is interesting for us as regards this part what happens is B B term cancels out. So, you simply get here lambda prime A. So, this is another translation in fact it is the Lorentz transformed translation and there is no Lorentz transformation left here. So, we have proved that the translations so we have proved that B lambda prime is any translation B lambda prime inverse is T 4. We'll, this is going to play an important role in a minute. Okay. okay. Now, the importance of the an invariant subgroup okay, is that uh, the thing I proved, okay, so like theorem. Okay, if H is invariant in G. invariant subgroup okay, in G then G over H which by definition is space of cosets. So, the it is G H I do not have to tell you left or right cosets because they are the same ok. This is a group is a group under set multiplication ok. In this group the inverse of g h well h is identity and the inverse of G H is G inverse H. Okay. This is where I stopped last time. So, now okay, I have to give you examples this is what I will do now, okay. but there is a problem which you should you should check out this problem. Okay which is one of the things there ok. The pro problem quite nice so, if let me write is I will simply make a sequence of statements if Pi is a homomorphism okay, from G to G prime. So, we consider a homomorphism from G to G prime, which we have defined. Okay. Then we know that pi of identity 
is identity e prime this we know okay but consider or g in g okay such that phi of g is e prime there is no reason why this map should be one to one so you have this g here your g and g prime so this identity of g prime this g prime and there will be many elements of course identity will go there but many other elements can go okay. then it is a fact this implies okay so this is called okay the kernel okay care pi for the map pi okay so all the things which go to identity now what i ask you to prove is prove that it is an invariant subgroup of g so the kernel of this homomorphism and we'll check it out in specific cases is an invariant subgroup of g and secondly okay b is a invariant subgroup so you can consider g modded by cur cur of pi okay this a group is isomorphic to to g prime so the kernel if you quotient g by the kernel of the map you will get back the image that you are getting okay. huh? yeah but uh, yes i am always assuming on to yeah. the image of the map pi of g will be g prime by assumption I am assuming it is on to. Okay. Otherwise, you have to do some other things. So, very often in the literature, and it is a nice thing to know. This is given by a a a, a, a map, a, a let's say a picture. Okay. So, let me show you what is called an exact sequence. of maps or let's say in this case it is homomorphism what does it mean so here i'll show you okay you got suppose you have groups and you put arrows i will assume always so you have maps here say pi 1 pi 2 now because if you say it is an exact sequence what it means is the kernel of i2 this means if it is an exact sequence kernel of pi2 is image of pi1 this is the rule what you get from here is picked up by this and mapped to the identity here okay. if you have a se sequence like this and you say it is exact okay that means this equation here okay. now slight generalization of this 
will lead you to what is called complex and if you had done any time differential geometry you will get it there okay. and it is quite general. So, why am I bringing this up by well so we can tell this so the problem is, the, is the statement So, I start with some uh, some group with some identity okay. So, I let me call it some group consisting of simply one identity one element E okay. They map it to G. So, this this in this mapping the image is this is only one element so it is one element here. So, in the next step okay. How do you, no this is not right no this is H. So, the next step I am mapping into G, since this is going to the identity, this map only identity goes to here. So, this is 1 to 1. So, the image of H is H here. So, in the next step I go to G over H. So, since the image of H here is H because this is 1 to 1, the kernel of this map is all of H, so it goes here. And then to express the fact that it is on to which uh, was uh, also mentioned, it goes to some other group, say some E prime. So, all of this goes to 1. So, this means that this must be on to because this map is picking up all of the kernel of this map is all of this. So, the image of this must be on to. So, this this picture here which is an example of what people call as an exact sequence is the result that I was stating here. Okay. This kind of result I did not do it just like that, okay. but if you are came some of you came to that other talk I gave yesterday. I do not know if you came ok. At some point we will be discussing um, defects and solitons ok and there you get these homotopy groups ok which is some topological characterization of some uh, configurations in quantum field theory and there this kind of uh, diagram happens to be very important ok. There are things called exact homotopy sequences and so on where this graph this kind of thing goes on and on and on ok. Um, uh, yeah, it goes on and on and on and on for the homotopy groups, okay. And it is very useful to compute. If you have that thing in mind, many times you can avoid computation and just read off the answer from looking at it, okay. So, this is a prelude to that kind of activity, okay. So, Let me then go on to examples. One, the simplest example I can one of the simplest example is, is the following. I take G to be SO3, O3, so it has uh, real orthogonal matrices with determinant plus 1 and minus 1. I take H to be SO3. So, the determinant here is plus 1 and since let us say say S R S inverse determinant is equal to determinant of R you see that S O 3 H is invariant. H is an invariant subgroup. Is okay. Now we want to find the cosets in their multiplication table. Okay. Well, if 
S is in O3 and determinant of S is equal to minus 1 we saw that I can write this as S as parity times R where P is the element minus 1 and R is in SO3. Hmm. which implies S yes, SO3 is P SO3. Because this this R here can be absorbed back here. So, there are only two cosets. Namely, SO3 and PSO3 and we can write down the multiplication table so we have SO3 PSO3 and likewise SO3 PSO3 right Here it is simply SO3 again, here it is PSO3, this multiplying this, this is again PSO3 and this is SO3. So, what is this group? What is this group O3 over SO3? Z2, right? Or S2. So, this is simply the permutation on two objects, call it, I called it S2 before. Isomorphic 2, when I write like this, up to isomorphism, that is it. Okay. Now, here is a more complicated example, namely, I want to check Poincare modded by. T4. Okay. What is this group? So, we want to know what this group is in some familiar language. We know that translations form an invariant subgroup. So, what is this? Well, anything like this, this is an element of the Poincare group, can be written as A1 times 0 lambda. We can check a plus yeah okay. a plus 1 0 is a 1 lambda this is lambda. So, if I look at translations times a lambda I am taking the right coset you can also take left coset what is this I insert this decomposition here and what happens to this? This is a translation, so it is swallowed by this T4. Okay. So, this becomes equal to T4 times 0 lambda, right? Yes. So, you can see what is the group, the quotient group, what is it? Huh? Lorentz group, right? So, it implies T4. 0 lambda. So, every coset is labeled like this, then I can pass this through. So, this is T 4 times 0 lambda lambda prime. So, this is isomorphic. So, we can say Moncare over translations is isomorphic to Lorentz group. There is another standard example which is simple but useful. So, let me also write this. Okay. Let us take the permutation group S n. 
Now, I just state now any S, any T can be written as T, T is equal to T1 up to Tk, where Ti are transpositions. We will prove this later, not difficult. Transposition means it exchanges two, only two of the elements. Okay. The way you write this is not unique. Okay. There are many ways of writing this, but what is unique is while in one T i are not unique, the this one okay, evenness or oddness of k is So, an even permutation is even, okay. you may write it in many different ways, but it will always stay even, likewise odd one. Okay. Now, this says therefore that consider all even permutations, they form a group because even times even is even. So, the set of and what is that group called, do you know? It is called the alternating group, subgroup. Okay. The set of all even permutations form a subgroup of S n is called A n of S n. It is called the alternating subgroup. Okay. Now, A n is normal in S n, okay. Okay. because okay. since let us look at T inverse. I given you T there, what is the inverse? You read it backwards, okay. is T k up to T 1, right, because T k in well T k squared is 1. Okay. The evenness T and T, T inverse are either both even or odd, okay. T k inverse are both even or odd. Because I can just read it backwards. This implies T A K A N T inverse is A N. Because maybe both are odd, but the product is even. So A N is an invariant subgroup of S N. Okay. Or A N is invariant. In S n. Hmm? What is the quotient? Is there any guess? Hmm? It is again S2, right. So, uh, clearly, okay, since any odd t I pick any okay, some particular transposition, call it T1 times some t prime okay. t 1 is any fixed transposition any transposition pick any one and t prime is e 1 it does not matter which you pick okay. 
it follows immediately just like in the previous cases that S n over A n is again isomorphic to S 2. Hmm? Now, there are uh, I have sort of looked at simple examples, but there is one point I want to make okay. record. See, you have got this G H G inverse is equal to H, okay. but G is an element of G. So, this elements of G is creating automorphisms of H. Okay. So, you remember at definition, so each G in G okay, creates an automorphism what is that call it f of g 0 f of g of h what is this f of g of h is g h g inverse right it is called it is conjugating the elements, so it is clearly an automorphism, and you do not leave H. Okay. So, it is creating an automorphism, but it is not inner, not necessarily inner, because this G here, in, do you know what is it in, what is the inner automorphism? There is, but there may not be. an H prime in H such that f of g is equal to f of H prime. G is any element of the group and it may be that there is no H prime like this. So, these automorphisms can be non trivial. Okay. Now, here is a in, no, actually okay. In fact, in many cases it is not. In fact, it is not trivial. Okay. One point to notice is. So check. So this is a new. The set of FGs. From a group. I need some notation, it may not be all the automorphisms of H. So, I need some notation for this, call it, let me call it automorphism prime of H. I am putting a prime there because I do not know that H I am exhausting all automorphisms of H. In general, that is not true also. Okay. show that the inner automorphisms is an invariant subgroup of this group okay. show <coughs> that the inner automorphisms which you remember what is the inner automorphisms okay. they are the ones which are created by the HS this is a easy proof okay. is is an invariant subgroup of this set here automorphism prime of okay. h and you can look at the quotient group okay the uh, just to complete okay. this is what we call the notation is the notation just for I will go to go on to something else okay. all automorphisms
of H is usually called as ot H. Okay. The inner automorphisms okay, of H, I think it is called in H, inner automorphisms of H. One can quite generally prove that this is a normal subgroup of OTH. Okay. It is not difficult. Okay. In H is normal in OTH and the quotient is called the outer automorphism. It's called outer automorphism, out edge. This structure happens. Okay. For example, this structure arises when one is look. If you have done Born-Oppenheimer approximation, do any of you know what it is? Okay. You um, in molecule in uh, when you are trying to do molecules, you have done it. You know what is Born-Oppenheimer? Rigid where you treat molecules as rigid bodies, you have done it, you have some familiarity. Then uh, the so called symmetry groups of the molecule are discrete subgroups of rotations called H, okay. and this, but they are sitting inside the rotation group. So, you can ask what are the automorphisms, what elements. Our, what rotations will leave this H invariant? Okay. What are the out? Okay. And in in general, there are a lot. For example, if you take uh, icosahedral group or something like that, there are a lot of these things, and they affect the physics of the problem. For example, the energy levels of the molecule, and you can detect them by transitions of lines in the molecule. Okay. So this is used in the analysis of, for example, molecular spectra. They are also they also turn up in discussions of quantum gravity. Okay, so this is an aside. Here, what is happening is that this automorphism of H, because I am dealing by putting H in G as an invariant subgroup, it may not be the full automorphism group, but at least it is a subgroup of the full automorphism group. Okay. okay. Actually, this thing, funnily enough also turns up in uh, things like um, proving the Poincare conjecture, you know what it is. Do you know what is a Poincare conjecture which was proved by Perelman? Okay. It is a claim that the only simply connected three dimensional compact manifold is S3, the three dimensional sphere. Okay. Every other compact uh, manifold in three dimensions is multiply connected. Okay. You know what is connectivity? If you take a loop, you cannot shrink it to a point. Okay. You cannot, uh. So, Poincare conjecture is in three dimensions, the only simply connected three manifold which is closed, which is compact and boundaryless is the three dimensional sphere. Okay. The proof of the theorem involves considerations of this kind. Okay. Some There is some thrust and there are some thrusting classification and things of this kind. Okay. So, where all this all the time you come across this kind of problem because they are all dealing with uh, uh, the rotation group SO3 and its various subgroups okay. Okay. Uh, in some S3 actually uh, SO3 or S3 and then is the way various groups various subgroups of SO3 act on three dimensional spheres okay. uh, that is where the whole thing comes. Okay. So, this is quite useful and the, the, those structures also turn up in considering quantum gravity. So, it is good to know these things. Okay. Now, I want to sorry compact ha huh. closed and but he will he will ask what is closed the technical uh, meaning of boundary less you know that uh, for example, if you take a disk, it has a boundary, you know. 
So, you have a uh, set of points whose neighborhoods do not look like what is in the, the tangent space looks different. You know what is tangent, take tangent with the compact for us meaning is that if every infinite sequence has a limit point. That is if you take line you can take infinite sequences going to infinity right. So, it is not compact, but on a circle you can never do this. So, if you take an infinite sequence it will have a limit point maybe more more than one ok. So, if you do complex analysis there is a standard result called the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem have you come across if you take a uh, bounded infinite sequence in the complex plane they will say there is a limit point you okay. you are doing complex variables you know no. In complex analysis one of the basic things you start from is to show that if you take a bounded infinity bounded means you have an infinite sequence all of which are bounded by some constant c fixed constant c. So, you cannot be put in some square ok all the points then the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem says that there is a limit point limit point means every neighborhood of it will intersect members of the sequence ok in which is the same statement as saying a bounded uh, a close bounded set in three in a plane is compact ok it is the same statement ok. So, compact means that every infinite sequence must have a limit point ok. In some sense it is volume is finite and so on ok. If you have a metric if you have, if you have, if you have a volume you, have, you know how to integrate it you have a metric then the volume of that space is finite Huh? That's another way. Yeah. And the maximum value. That's another way to say it. A continuous function. That's another way of carrying. Any continuous function on a compact set is bounded ok and it has a minimum and a maximum ok any continuous that is another way is completely equivalent statement every continuous function okay, on a compact set is bounded continuous function complex valued it is a real valued it is a maximum and the minimum as you are saying ok. So, that is completely equivalent these are completely equivalent statements ok. Now, I want to tell you another concept ok namely conjugacy classes this is another way of dividing a group up into disjoint sets ok. And this one we will see that that one cosets well cosets is a device for device dividing a group by another group if it is invariant. But later we will see especially when we if we consider representations of Poincare group that cosets is a way of classifying group actions on manifolds ok. Every time you have a group say rotation group is acting on the two dimensional sphere ok right you rotating rotating the points then we can there is a immediate way of identifying the sphere with a cosy space immediately and one can prove that essentially all group actions on manifolds can be given by taking appropriate cosets ok or their unions. So, that is one very important property of cosets for physicists ok in many times we use this ok. For example, when you consider solitons it plays a very important role. Conjugacy classes on the other hand turns out to play a very important role in representation theory ok. It enables you to count the distinct representations. We will see later that in some sense when I finish uh, ok we have, we have not defined what is meant by a representation, but the number of these conjugacy classes will give you the number of these representations. And there is some algebraic structure underlying this 
it will tell you what will happen if you compose angular momenta for example. Okay. So, what is this? Okay. The, the class the conjugacy class containing G0 in G okay, is a set okay, G, G0, G inverse or G in G. Yes, conjugate. This also partitions the, the group. Okay. So, you can see immediately. Okay. Oh, example okay. the conjugacy the class containing E E is simply the identity as I said, but in general there will be many conjug the class containing in permutation. So, in S n Uh, well, I, I I have to come back to it later. It is given by something called the cycle structure, but so I'll come so or it will immediately lead you to some partitions partitions of integers. So we'll come to that later. Okay. So this is a very simple. Thing. So notice again that this is equivalence relation. Note that. Okay. Uh, what is the note? Uh, uh, being in a class. defines an equivalence relation what do i mean let me call it like so okay, what does it mean that it means that means that it is uh, uh, symmetric that is if g1 is equivalent to g2 If G2 is the same equal class as G1, this implies G2 is equal to G1 okay, to G is, is, is uh, reflexive that means G is equal to itself kind of, kind of trivial. And thirdly, it is transitive. There is G1 equal to G2, G2 equal to G3 means G1 is equal to G3. Okay. So, this is what is meant by an equivalence relation, okay. it is an equivalence class, okay. they are all related, they are all related by declaring that they are in the same uh, conjugacy class I define a relationship which has this, these three properties. Okay. I just mentioned it in passing okay. uh, yeah I want to give one example of an equal of a conju conjugacy class okay. consider example consider SO3 okay. the conju the conjugacy class containing I take a particular element okay. rotation by angle theta around axis n okay, call it r n theta what is the conjugacy class 
taking an axis and rotating, considering the rotation by an angle theta. Now, I will now, the conjugacy class will take this and conjugate it by an arbitrary element of SO3. What will I get? What will it do? It will give the same angle, but all axis okay. is okay. it will be this thing r m theta okay, where m is any axis the angle will not change I will just rotate this here. So, rotation will just take one axis to another axis. So, I will get all rotations by the same angle okay. this by the way will this equation will come back to us when we start looking at representations of the rotation group. Okay. Now, as a final two conceptual statements generic statements before I go into the what is the heart of physics namely representations okay. huh? it is a sphere it is not a sphere rotation it is a sphere it is not sphere with antipodal points identified it is just a sphere the other one will be some rp2 or something it will be non orientable or whatever it, no, it is not that so actual axis is the same angle hmm. okay now i want to make two more definitions okay simple groups a simple a group is simple group g is simple if it has no invariant subgroup besides of course there is always two trivial things okay, the identity and g simple groups are have a particular simplicity we will see that being simple means it tells something about when you try to represent these groups by linear operators they have some specific property which is very easy and to deal with okay. now what are examples it is not easy to prove okay, but it is a fact that so3 and I and the connected Lorentz group that is Lorentz group which preserves the sense of time and has determinant plus one are simple. I will omit the proof it is not so um, it is not so obvious ok I think so far as I know in the second case certainly in the first case it is beginner actually showing by 3 by 3 matrix 3 by 3 matrices here and dealing with it I think you will find a proof of it in this book on group theory and quantum mechanics and the Lorentz group also is not so easy to prove but there exist proofs. But SU2 is not simple, not simple. Let me give you a sequence of examples A SU2. So, it has it has an invariant subgroup, what is it? I mean, it is I am saying it is not simple, that means it has some invariant subgroup, what is it? We have seen this. For a, uh, uh, in center, uh, one and minus one. No? Okay, it has invariant subgroup is
h will be simply 1 and minus 1. It is obvious, huh? s u n is not simple. For any n, I am looking at not simple. So, I have to give you for s u n what is the invariant subgroup? Call it h. So, what is h? Here, there is some analog of this city here for any n what will it be ok the it has to be unitary matrix with determinant plus 1 right. So, it has to be of the form exponential i 2 pi over n k times unit matrix n cross n ok where k will run from 0 up to n minus 1. So, it is the center is the roots of unity or yeah z n z n by z n I mean roots of unity nth roots of unity yeah nth roots of unity nth 0 1 2 3 yeah there are n elements for s u 2 you have 2 elements s u n you have n elements this thing is what distinguishes if you know something about q c d quarks from gluons. the way this uh, pro, uh, the response of those quantum fields under h this subgroup tells a quark apart from a gluon ok. Now, as a final example let me look at c Poincare group it is not simple because we have seen that h is the translation subgroup. So, Poincare group is not simple. Simple groups have a certain simplicity because it tells you something about the representations okay, or when you go into linear operators, but it turns out that the Poincare group even though it is not simple it has some other particular structure inside it which makes it very easy to deal with from the point of view of a field theorist. Whereas, if you look at the Lorentz group and look at its properties they are very complicated ok. So, it is a very striking situation that is if you try to understand Lorentz group there is a whole book Neymar has a whole book on the Lorentz group ok it is very complicated ok. Whereas, the Poincare group we shall see later we can easily understand ok and it tells you something about uh, it, it is because of this structure we are able to tell that for example, if you have a uh, particle of uh, if you have an elementary particle we can tell what are the possible spins of the elementary particle ok. What will happen to the angular momentum if you go to a moving frame all these things can be completely stated essentially after some preparatory material in one lecture ok. So, it simple does not necessarily mean simple in all ways in some particular ways there may be certain simplicities. Okay, I will stop here and we will continue with this tomorrow.